We saw the value of the work. We saw the value of training. We saw the value of somebody in a craft that is willing to teach you their craft and not, not be afraid that somebody's going to take their job. Our tradition has been that you bring people in, you have classroom training, but 90% of the work is done on the job training. So we get paid on the job, but we have that mentor that is teaching us their craft. And what you do as you go through that four or five year apprenticeship, you develop those skills, you work with so many different journey workers. And when you do that, you take a piece of them and then you take another piece here and then you create your way of working. And then you pass that along to the next generation. is Associations Thrive, the podcast celebrating successful associations and their leaders. I'm your host, Joanna Pineda, CEO and Chief Troublemaker at Matrix Group International. Listen in as top association executives tell all, revealing the creative and innovative ways they're increasing membership, generating revenue, nurturing engagement, and reimagining their organizations. By the way, if you've launched a new initiative, created new member services, or updated your governance structure and are seeing great results, I want to hear your story and so do my listeners. I'd love to have you as a guest. Go to podcast.matrixgroup.net and apply to be on Associations Thrive. Now let's dive into this week's show. Today, I have the huge honor of speaking with Joe Sellers, who is General President of SMART, the International Association of Sheet Metal, Air, Rail, and Transportation Workers. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you, Joanna. It's great to be here. Good to be with you again. We were COVID slowed, but here we are. Hey, so Joe, tell us about SMART. So SMART is a, as you indicated, is a sheet metal, air, rail, and transportation workers. We represent sheet metal workers, which I am by craft. That's my craft. We represent transportation and freight rail. So we have a freight rail transportation division, conductors and engineers and other workers that are on a freight rail system, as well as the mechanical side. We do maintenance and repairs and stuff like that. We do transportation transit, which is buses and commuter trains. So we do that as well. We have you know, a lot of people on buses, maybe in your listeners' neighborhood or community, as well as Amtrak and other services that our transit rail system members work on. So they're conductors there as well. So that's what makes up smart sheet metal, air, rail, and transportation workers. So Joe, SMART as an organization represents a pretty diverse array of professions and careers and crafts. Maybe give us some examples of the work that they do. As a sheet metal craft, we are HVAC, so we do a lot of work in the construction, the fabrication. So everything that we do starts with a flat sheet of metal. We bend it, form it, ship it to the job, and then our field teams install it. Also, the same thing happens on building enclosure systems. So when you're passing by a building that has a metal cladding on it, of whether it's a copper clad or whether it's a, an aluminum we have our architectural group that installs them and they install the, you know, on buildings, the big drainage systems that are coming off of those roofs and stuff like that. So that's part of the sheet metal side. We also have manufacturing. So we have manufacturing workers that make sheet metal manufacturing fans and air handling equipments. You know, in some cases, it may be the air handling system that may be in your home. Uh -huh. They manufacture them in a production manufacturing setting. And then we have testing, adjusting, and balancing where we balance the system to make sure that the design engineer, when, when they went in and, and designed the building to be at 71 degrees, how do you make sure that the whole building is functioning the way that is so that every room is 71 degrees, not just the top floor where the exec is? You know, that could be the 50th floor, but you want to make sure that the person on the fourth floor on an interior office has the same airflow to maintain a 71 degree temperature to be comfortable while they're working so that they can you know, make sure that they're productive in their work, which goes to ventilation, making sure that the ventilation standards are, are met, 
making sure that the indoor air quality is maintained properly over time. So those are some of the things that we do. And, and as you have building enclosure systems, it's going to be important to make sure that buildings are tight, right? We want to be energy efficient. We want to make sure that we're reducing our carbon footprint. In both of those areas, it's really important to make sure that, that the HVAC systems are up to date. They're not outdated. They're using the technology that will make them efficient, energy efficient, as well as the building enclosure systems. Make sure that the building's tight. But with a tight building, you need the proper ventilation. If ventilation's poor, people get tired and their productivity is not the greatest. So education, if you're in a school, education's the same way. Students that don't have good ventilation or good indoor air quality, they're not learning at the pace that they need to be. And as well on the teacher side, they're not able to teach in the same capacity when they don't have that good indoor air quality or the right ventilation for that classroom. So it is in our schools, it's in the buildings that we work in, and it's in the homes that we live in. You know, how do we make them good indoor air quality? How do we make sure that they're safe systems? And how do we make sure that we're reducing our energy costs and having energy efficient systems in there? Wow. So that's on the sheet metal side. And on the the transportation side, you represent quite a number of professions as well. Yes. We represent conductors. We represent engineers. We represent yard masters, which direct the trains. We do conductors on transit. We do bus drivers. Hey, so before we talk about the things that SMART is doing to thrive as an association, let's talk about your journey. Tell us about it and tell us how you got started. So I come from Philadelphia. I grew up in the city. I was born and raised in a row home, what we call row homes in Philadelphia. And I grew up in this neighborhood that was a highly union neighborhood. So I went around the circuit. I tried to go to the sheet metal workers. I went to the iron workers. I went to the electricians. I, I went around the oh, circuit interesting. to become an apprentice. I mean, that was my goal. So I went around. And I didn't get in my first time. I got turned down by everyone. Ah. And then I went around the circuit again the next year. And fortunately enough, I got in the second year. I was an inch away from being in the Navy, quite frankly. I, I had my physical. I didn't sign my papers. But my apprenticeship papers came in, and I jetted right towards that apprenticeship. Why was it important to be in the union? My whole neighborhood, that's what I grew up that's with. the neighborhood. That's, okay. We saw the value of the work. We saw the value of training. We saw the value of somebody in a craft that is willing to teach you their craft and not, not be afraid that somebody's going to take their job. Our tradition has been that you bring people in, you have classroom training, but 90% of the work is done on the job training. So we get paid on the job, but we have that mentor that is teaching us their craft. And ah. we work with a variety of mentors. And what you do as you go through that four or five year apprenticeship you develop those skills. You work with so many different journey workers. And when you do that, you take a piece of them and then you take another piece here and then you create your way of working. And then you pass that along to the next generation. So I think my neighborhood was, that's what unions were. My father was a sheet metal worker. As I said, I didn't get in the first year. I was able to get in the second year, but I was able to do that. I was able to see the lifestyle that my family had. And I knew my father and my parents they grew up in a neighborhood where they didn't have those types of things. I was born with health care. While I was young, I didn't really think much about a pension, but I do today. And yes. I think a lot about pensions. Yeah. So, you know, those types of things that people developed and the curriculum that I learned to that were generations before I came along were taking care of the generation that I came from and every generation after that. And the one thing about my neighborhood is when you announced that you got your apprenticeship, the whole neighborhood cheered for you. Aww. You know, they were like proud of you. And, and you know what? I think I had a sense of Joe made it, right? Joe's going to be good. Joe's going to be okay. I have the same sense today. My son, after I left Philadelphia, he didn't want anything to do with what I did. He had no desire to be a sheet metal worker. I come to DC a couple of years later. He says, hey, I got in the apprenticeship. Okay, that's fantastic. So I think he wanted to burn his own course and he wanted to make sure his trail was his trail and not my trail, which I'm proud of. But I feel like I'm the same way. All right. Nick made it. Nick's going to be OK. He's going to have that health care. He's going to have that pension. He's going to have that retirement security. And he's going to have that community that a union brings. We call each other brother and sister, and it has meaning behind it. 
that we treat each other as a family, we treat each other as a community, and we take that back to the place where we live and we help our own communities, whether it's being a baseball coach or a football coach or helping with a handicap ramp for our neighbors. You know, we bring that skills and ability to our communities. So, Joe, how do you go from being a sheet metal worker in Philadelphia to general president of the international? I did well in my apprenticeship. And then I went to eight years of night school. So when I did that eight years of night school, it gave me a real good idea and it was trade specific. So at some point, our training coordinator, which is kind of like a principal of a school that runs the training center. So what I did is I applied for that vacancy and put my resume together and did an interview and I got that job. And then four years later, another position and, you know, I kept my head down. I, you know, I, I have a good work ethic. I work hard. Our members work hard. We need to make sure that we're eight for eight, eight hours of work for eight hours of pay. Boom. We need to make sure that we're working hard in our industry. So I work hard. And then a local union position came up and that's an elected position. So I had to run for it. And then our business manager moved on and I got elected to be the business manager. And then I became the vice president of the international, which wasn't a full-time job. It was working at the local union and then becoming a vice president. And then a position opened up and I was asked to become the number two person at the international. And unfortunately, our general president got sick and he had to retire because of his illness. And I got elected to become general president. So I had a lot of people that mentored me and every step of the way, I think I'm the product of the village. The village built my career. The village took me from point A of being a neighborhood kid in Northeast Philadelphia to every step of the way being mentored and listening. You know, you got to listen, you got to pay attention. I take it very seriously. And the village built me to what I am today. And that was every step. I love it. And as general president, you get to help build the village. Let's talk about that village. So yeah. SMART is a giant organization. You have 203,000 members is what the website says today. That's right. So how is membership? Membership is good. In the construction industry, things are going to really boom. So right now, you know, you have the infrastructure, you have the Chips and Science Act, you have the Inflation Reduction Act, you have the American Rescue Plan. All those funds are now being worked on what are those projects going to look like. So they just don't happen right away. They're in the pipeline and they got to get regulatory. They need permits. They need all that. So what's happening, all that's going on right now. And that money is going to start seeing, you know, buildings go up and chip plants go up and electric car plants, battery manufacturing, battery storage, recycling, all that is going to come out over the next several years. And all that work is going to be generational growth that is going to grow generations of sheet metal workers for putting people on the job this year. But some of these jobs are going to be 15 years long. A chip plant is always turning over, right? The chips are always changing. You may build a chip plant and then you don't even get finished because then you retool module number one right. while you're working on module number three still. So it's going to be generational growth for us. And we think that what happens there is you need a city to support that. So, you know, those jobs are in the middle of a cornfield today. And then as they make sure they build these manufacturing plants, they're going to build a city around that because the support structure that will maintain that plant needs to be built. You're going to need a population shift to work on those jobs, work on the manufacturing of chips or batteries or automotive cars. And what happens is a city pops up. So then now you have people needing schools and hospitals and supermarkets, that infrastructure. So there are a lot of jobs. And when you see that job opportunity, that growth pattern, it is exciting, right? I, I get energized. I get excited about what the future looks like and how can we bring more people into a good union middle-class job? You hear President Biden say that all the time. We want to make sure that we bring people into the middle class. And that's what we are. That's the craft that I wanted so many years ago, a good union middle-class job. It doesn't get any better than that. And this administration, our President Biden and every administrative leader, and those people are all supportive of that because they provide a good middle-class job. It's very exciting. And in the freight rail side, 
that's getting busy as well. There was a lot of lean times when they were laying off conductors and engineers. Well, now they need to build that back up. There's been, you know, regulatory things that weren't really good for workers in the rail industry. And you've probably heard a lot about that over negotiations sure. and the fire in the East Palestine. But now the railroads are ramping up and there's a lot of job opportunities there as well. So in general, we're excited about the outlook. We're excited about where we can go, how we can grow, how we can represent more people, how we can negotiate collective bargaining agreements for all members, all workers that are within our crafts. It is a very exciting time. So, Joe, you're seeing some explosive growth opportunities. Every CEO I have on this podcast says, we're going to need more people or we need people now. Where are you going to find them? And how do you cultivate or attract this new generation of people to the craft, to union? And where are they coming from? We are in every community. And as I said, my career path was to be the training coordinator. So our apprenticeship programs is the infrastructure that we have for 100 years of getting into the apprenticeship program, going to classroom instruction, as I said, and then on the job training. So that is our infrastructure. We need to make sure we have the right recruitment and retention programs to be able to get out to every community, let them know what the opportunities are, let them know what the uh, apprenticeship program is about. Let them know what ongoing professional development means. Life is a journey of education. It just doesn't stop when you get out of high school. It doesn't stop when you get out of college. And it certainly doesn't stop when you get out of your apprenticeship program. So you can go to your local union. You take those classes. You can pick a part of a a craft that you want to be. We have a very diversified structure that we have. And we need to make sure that we're in every community doing recruitment and retention. And I know everybody talks about recruitment and retention. Right. We want to make sure that we're working together with our partners. And I think something that may set us separately is our recruitment and retention is done by SMART, the union, SMACNA, our management partners, and ITI, which is our training. So we bring all three of them together and we work on that together at a national level. And then we develop that and we make sure we get that down to the local level. So we have a program that we call B4ALL. Construction industry has a history of rough and tumble. I had to do it that way and I want you to do it that way. It's just tough and rumble. And we want to make sure that we have the plans and the programs to make sure that we welcome people onto a job site, that we have a very intensive recruitment program for women in the trades. But they need to be welcomed onto the job. They need to be mentored when they get on the job. They need to make sure that they have somebody they can go to. So we have women's committee. We have a national women's committee that develops plans and programs. And then they share that with local union women's committees. We want to make sure that we're in communities of color, making sure that everybody understands what we have, what we have to offer. Oh, by the way, when you come out of your apprenticeship, you don't have all this college debt. So that is a big plus, but people need to know what that really is and what being in a union is, what an apprenticeship means and what being a journey level person really means. That's an education process. So the programs that we're developing are to try to make sure that all of our local areas, our training centers are out there doing that recruitment for us and creating an environment that is welcoming so that we can retain, so that we have that mentor system And if something happens to a person that may not feel like they have a mentor, who can they go to? A woman, person of color, military. We have a smart hero program where we go into a military base. They actually bring in 15 military soldiers and they go to our school for seven weeks. That is like their transition to civilian life. The curriculum is similar across the United States and Canada. It's similar. So when they come out, they can go back to Philadelphia and join the apprenticeship program. They don't have to do their first year because they've already done that when they were in the military. So now they get an advancement of wages and everything else that goes along with that. So then they go back to Alabama. They can go back to New Jersey. They can go back to Oklahoma and have the same career path as anybody else across the country in the area that they call home, not the transitioning base that they came from. And the satisfaction of their family knowing. They have a job to go back to. They have health care 
when they hit that job. And then they have the dignity and the family structure that they had in the military. So right, right. it's a very proud program for us. And we just did our 500th transition. We put 500 people through wow. this program and they're scattered all over the country. It was a lot of work to set up, but being able to get in, that's a part of our recruitment and retention. You know, 500 is a great number and that will continue to build. But that's one of many programs that we've done. Man, I hope that program is wildly successful. You know, we work with Helmets to Hard Hats, yes. which, as you know, helps transitioning military find careers in the construction trades. And when we interviewed the vets who had made the transition, they said that it was the brotherhood or the sisterhood. It was the mission and it was the community feel of the construction trades that really attracted them to it because those are things that they're looking for. We use that as our base. We totally complement Helmets of Hard Hats. Every student of ours actually goes through the Helmets of Hard Hat program. So they're part of that. We're kind of like a subsidiary where we have a unique program where we're being able to bring transitioning soldiers into one of our classes, one of our schools. Even before they transition, it sounds like. That's right. Yeah. Where they get discharged. That's correct. Joe, it sounds like as part of this growth, that DENI is a big part of this because that's where you're going to find all those people. So how do you change this culture? You talked about how construction has this reputation for being a rough and tumble culture. I sat in a training program where somebody said, well, you know, it's always been done that way. Actually, you won't be shocked by this, but hopefully you will be. Somebody said, you know, the hazing has to stop. And somebody said, well, we treat everybody poorly. You know, yeah. we don't just pick on the people of color or the women. And the trainer said, yeah, but it's going to be perceived differently. So how do we change that culture? We've been trying to change that culture for years now. We have a women's committee. So we put a women's committee together. And I'll, I'll give you an example. So I think it was maybe 2015. We have an annual conference. And in that annual conference, we have a big plenary session. And then we go into breakout sessions. So we had our women's committee have a breakout session. And I was worried that people would go to other sessions. And I don't want to go to women's committee. I don't want to do this. But I will say, I walked into that room and it was overflowing. The room wasn't big enough. People were standing around the sides. My main concern was, build it, will they come? Well, they did come. Nice. And then my next concern was engagement. Are they going to engage? It took like three minutes. The way the women's committee laid out their presentation the way they engaged all of the participants that were in each one of those sessions that they ran. They didn't run, run. They they ran two every day for three days. Packed to the gills with great content and full engagement with the representatives that were there, which was great to see. So we did that. And then as that building committee continued to grow, we went to our convention in 2019 and they created constitutional amendments and resolutions, which changed the way we guide ourselves over the next five years. So our last one was 2019. And not only did they build those amendments and resolutions, they took it to a variety of committees that would be on the floor voting for them. And all of the sweat equity that they put into those amendments, everyone got approved unanimously by a thousand delegates. Changes like it's a chargeable offense. We call each other brother and sister. So our constitution guides us, but it's a chargeable offense to bully, haze, harass another member. Somebody can prefer charges against them. And there's fines and penalties up to expulsion for some of those cases. We back then also put in there that at local meetings that they need to read out a code of conduct. And I think since 2019, so we're four years now where every meeting, so union local unions have meetings every month. Every month, that local reads out the code of conduct and says that we're going to conduct ourselves, and this is what we expect from you, and this is how you're going to conduct yourself. And that's just not in this meeting. That is on the job. So over time, does it saturate to everybody in the first year or the first two years or even the first four years? But it sets a tone that wherever they go, they hear we're going to These be These are the values. Yes. And we do that at the national level, every meeting that they go to. So if you get in leadership, you come to one of the meetings that we have for business managers or business reps, that same code of conduct is read out before every meeting so that they know now this is our culture. Now, have everybody embraced it? No. 
But this is our culture, and we're going to change that over this period of time. So there were a lot of great things that were done in 2019 that helps recruit women, people of color. One of our goals was to be able to double the size of our women in our craft to the next convention, right? So in that five-year period, that was our goal, and that resolution passed. So being out there and making sure that each local is out there recruiting women and people of color is really important to us. And those types of programs is changing our culture. Culture doesn't change in one year, five years. Culture changes over generations. And we have a quick pace to that. And then that's where that beef for all comes in. So when we talk about DE&I, working with SMACNA, working with SMART, working with ITI, we have training programs that we develop at a national level and we pass them down to locals, not only local unions, we pass them down to SMACNA contractors and we pass them down to training centers, toolbox talks, let's say. So there's a toolbox talk on every job across the United States and Canada. Toolbox talks about being a good working partner, being a good mentor, making sure that we're welcoming and those types of things that not only are read out of the union meeting or when you're sitting in an apprentice class, but they're also being read out at a job site meeting within our craft that this is what we expect. This is what we need. We need to continue to mentor those that are coming in and those that have been around a long time. Everybody needs, like I said, this is a lifelong journey, lifelong education. So that mentoring process doesn't stop. And I think that's unique. I haven't heard of anybody having labor management and training with the same meetings, with the same publications, with the same education to be able to recruit, retain, change a culture and be welcoming. Boy, that is amazing. It really speaks to the commitment that you have as an entire organization that at different levels of the organization, you're really developing the values, providing guidance and providing training. So I can't wait to see what happens, you know, in the next five years, in the next 10 years. Joe, one thing that you say you're really proud of, in addition to all the things that you've talked about, is the emphasis on mental health that SMART has. So what are you doing in this area? I keep hearing about how, you know, in general, times are tough, but this pandemic has really done a number on such a big part of our population. So what's going on there? So we've been developing what we call our SMART Members Assistance Program, SMART MAP, and we've been doing that for many years. We also have a related organization called SHMOIT. SHMOIT is the occupational safety arm of our industry, Labor Management Smart SMACNA. So SHMOIT, SHMOIT did a lot of safety training, safety and curriculum development, and they also had a mesothelioma side of that, asbestosis, right? So mm-hmm. many of our members were exposed to asbestos, but as time goes on, there's less and less exposure. So as generations come through, So what we've taken that focus, we still do the asbestos, we still do the testing, the respiratory testing, and there are any lesions or anything that needs to be taken care of. So we still do that, but we've taken the focus of SHMOIT and we've developed this smart map members assistance program. And that really deals with substance use disorder, mental health, and suicide prevention. We are more likely as a construction craft, five times more to die from suicide than we are from a construction-related accident. Oh, my God. Now, the construction industry is number one. Some could say number two, depends on what the study is, but we're one or two. Tragic anyway. So if there was a job where there's a casualty on that job, there's a whole network of things that are going to happen on that job. Well, we want to prevent that. We want to create peer-to-peer. When somebody's in crisis, How do we make sure they know who to talk to? And crisis looks differently, right? Crisis could be personally. Crisis could be about my spouse or about my child or my family. And you never know when that moment's going to hit or walk on the job site and you see somebody that's in stress. How do we help them? How do we get them from that moment to the next, right? It's moments at a time. And then how do we get them to somebody that they can talk to? So we have a helpline that runs 24-7. We have an organization that's a mental health organization that helps us. It's at the national level. And then we let locals buy into that. So we leverage our size and we negotiate for all locals. And then they can buy into this program for members assistance and Ah. give them the help that they need so that that member can go from that stat 
I'll tell you this. I mean, I've been touched in this area so many times by my talking to people. And I have one member that came and said, thank you. You kept me from the click. Oh. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. You kept me from the click. Those are the moments that you say, we got to do better. Right? And because you kept him from the click, you did good. And how else can you help other people? Yep. So how do we create this peer-to-peer structure, which we are doing so that every job has a peer. Every job is somebody that's identified somehow that if I need somebody to talk to and I walk on that job site, I know I can go to Joe or I know I can go to Walt or Jane to have a conversation. So Joe, at the start of the year, you announced your retirement after 43 years and at the end of May, you're retiring. So what are you retiring to and are you moving back to Philadelphia? I am moving back to Philadelphia. I will say I didn't think of it this way. So when you move to D.C., there's a whole lot going on, certainly far different than Philadelphia. But my wife, after a couple of years, was able to move down here. I mean, I know I'm retiring. I know I'm going back to Philadelphia. But let me put it in perspective where my wife is packing right now. Yeah. And I noticed last month that she's like happy. And I'm like, she's not like the packer, right? She's not like the person that. Who likes to pack? It's no fun. Yeah, right. So she's not the packer. So I noticed that she's happy. And it kind of dawned on me that she's going back to her kids. She's going Uh, back to her mother. She's going back to both of our families. And that makes me happy. And I'm going to go home and I'm going to find my hobbies. I'm going to go play more golf. I'm going to go fish. I'm going to spend some time with my adult children. They don't have children yet, but they have a long time boyfriend and girlfriend. And I'm going to enjoy my family and catch up with them and figure out what retirement is in my head and how do I enjoy my family. And frankly, they deserve it. They deserve my attention. And I haven't been able to give them a lot of it while I'm in a leadership position, whether it was back home, because it really does impact the family structure. Sure. But quite frankly, if it wasn't for my wife and it wasn't for my kids, there would be no Joe Seller sitting in, in the general president's position or any other position because life changes for them and it's time for me to appreciate them. Well, and maybe when you're back, you'll mentor the next generation of sheet metal workers. You'll be back in Philadelphia. Yes, that's right. Yeah, looking forward to it. Joe, you've had an amazing career at SMART. Is there one moment that you think about sometimes and think, wow, that really was the moment where something important or big happened that led you here? Absolutely. My wife and I, she wasn't my wife. She was my girlfriend at the time. I was a second year apprentice and we got in a bad motorcycle accident. She was in the hospital for three weeks. I was in the hospital for six. During that time, I worked for a very large mechanical contractor in the Philadelphia area. And the vice president of the sheet metal division, his son got in a motorcycle accident and he was in the bed right next to me. Now, I said, this is a big company, right? I'm a second year apprentice. Nobody knows me. Joe who? I'm there. I'm laying. I got, I'm in traction. I got all kinds of stuff hanging out of me. And he pokes his head in and he says, he introduces himself and says, wish you well. And then when his son left before I did, he said, if there's anything I can ever do, give me a call. So I was out of work for seven months and I gave him a call and he said, come into the office. I said, well, I'm still on crutches. He said, come into the office. And from that moment, coming into that office, I had learned all the inside work to our craft. I learned right. the digital age changed for us. Being young, I was the second person into the digital age. So when one piece of equipment came in, I was the second person in. When another piece of equipment came in, I was the second person in. So that really changed my life. And I'd never forget that guy. As a matter of fact, it's funny because I tried calling him. When I became general president, I tried calling him just to let him know that, thank you. And I did pretty well. And he wouldn't return my call. So I knew his son back in the Philadelphia area. And I I called him and he said, what do you want? I said, I just want to thank him. And he says, yeah, he's not going to call you back. (laughs) I said, well, tell him thank you. And I actually ran into him at an industry event. Yeah. And it was great to see him and I had a chance to thank him. I did all right. You know, I hear stories like this of how the family, like you said, the brotherhood and the sisterhood really takes care of each other. And that's very, very meaningful. Yep. I would not be here if it wasn't for that man. 
Wow. Well, Joe, thank you so much for sharing that story. Thank you for sharing your journey and congratulations on an amazing career. I'm sure you're not done. So I'm going to check in with you at the end of the year and say, what are you doing next? I am so grateful that you came on the podcast. Congratulations. Thank you, Joanna. It's been great working with you for many years in several capacities yes. along my journey. And it's been a great relationship. And thank you very much. Yeah, listeners, I met Joe when he was at Local 19. We had a wonderful partnership. He came to Washington and my team is still working with his and he has a wonderful team. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Associations Thrive. We're so glad to have you here. You know, my personal mission and the mission of my company, Matrix Group International, is to help associations and nonprofits increase membership, generate revenue, and thrive in the digital space. I want to hear stories of how your organization is thriving in today's challenging landscape. Please apply to be on my show by going to podcast.matrixgroup.net. By the way, do you need help with a digital initiative? Maybe it's a website redesign, a new membership database, or a hybrid meeting that you're planning. I'd love to connect with you. Please visit the Matrix Group website at matrixgroup.net. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode of Associations Thrive. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, leave a five-star rating, post a comment, and share it with your colleagues and friends. Bye! Bye!